Good afternoon, uh, everyone. This time, I'm going to talk about um, my life as a Cold War fighter pilot. And I've had a good life. I've had a very exciting life, very interesting. And uh, I would like now to just tell my story. But to set the scene, I would uh, have to add that uh, I do have flying in my blood because my father was uh, a Battle of Britain pilot and I grew up in South Africa uh, where he was born in fact. Uh, I was born in, in the UK at the end of the war um, but then we went back to South Africa although we oscillated between South Africa and the UK for a few years. We went back to South Africa where I went to school and university there. The aircraft that I was looking at in the sky sort of uh, the attraction be became too much and I applied to join the Royal Air Force uh, whilst in South Africa. I did my uh, medical tests with the South African Air Force. I did my uh, aptitude tests at the University of Witwatersrand or Witwatersrand, basically Johannesburg University. And I did my final interviews with the uh, British Defence Liaison Staff at their lovely little uh, uh, headquarters in Pretoria. I had an interview panel of three, and when I, when I came, came out, sort of sat down waiting for them to come through, they came through and they said, um, well, congratulations, Rick, we've accepted you for pilot training. When would you like to sail, and what would you like to drink? I thought this augurs well for the future. Sailing, I, uh, had, six weeks later, I sailed on the Cape Town Castle from Cape Town to Southampton. Two-week uh, voyage, as an, ranked as an AC-2 aircraftman too well, sort of, well I had the time of my life on that on that trip it was fantastic arrived at Southampton where cold February morning um, I didn't understand a word that the dockers were saying it sounded like another language um, and then I went straight into officer training and then into my flying training I did but I was too old to go to Cranwell they said we would have sent you to Cranwell but uh, to do the three-year course I was too old to go to Cranwell because I'd been at university and so I, I did the other route, and I did a, a four-month officer training course, and uh, passed that, and then I went off for my flying training. I did a, a year's basic flying training on the Jet Provost um, up at um, RAF Acklington in Northumberland. I must admit, you know, having arrived there, when I said, right, you're off now for your basic flying training, you're going to Acklington. We, we went to, it. in those days, the RAF had four different flying training bases. I looked at the map, and I thought, I said, Northumberland, that's the other side of the world. All I'll say was, I had a, a fantastic year in Northumberland. Accrington's a lovely place right on the coast. It became a, a, a prison once the RAF had sort of given it up and then it was turned into a coal mine. Uh, but Northumberland is a lovely place and I had a very pleasant year at, uh, at there. At the end of the course, uh, which I did very well on, coming up at the top, we came to our posting and we were being streamed onto fast jets, as they called, or multi-engine, or helicopters. And they called me in and they said, Rick, we'd like to go, you go fly helicopters. And I said, I don't want to fly helicopters. My father was a fighter pilot. I want to be a fighter pilot. They said, well, go away and think about it. We, the helicopters, in those days, it was a fairly, the, the helicopters were building up. And they said to me, they said, we, we, want, we need people with leadership potential to go into the helicopter world. So they said, go away and think about it. A week later, they came back and said, um, well, um, we still like you to go to helicopters, Rick. I said, uh, well, I would still like to go and be a fighter pilot. So because I came up at the top of the course, I got my way, and I didn't go to helicopters then, although later in my career, I did fly helicopters, but I flew absolutely everything. And I know and, and the helicopter world is a very interesting um, and enjoyable world to be in. But I went off to be become a fighter pilot. I had to go through my advanced flying training first and then be posted to the right aircraft. So I went off to um, RAF Valley in, uh, on Anglesey where I did a six month course this time on um, an aircraft called the Nat, uh, which was uh, a very, it's a little sports car. It was a quantum leap forward as far as aircraft performance was from the Jet Provost. It was fast, it could actually, actually go supersonic in a, in a dive but it was a real sports car, it was a lovely aircraft to fly. Quite challenging as well, uh, it, it could catch you out on one or two things, but as far as training people to then go and fly the high performance aircraft that there were in front of me, it was a jolly fine trainer. So I did my six months there, uh, learning everything 
that I've learnt at uh, in the basic flying, you know, sort of general handling, formation, navigation, uh, night flying, and the rest, but just sort of higher performance aircraft, low level, lots of low level. At the end of that course, we were posted. I and uh, I actually won the flying trophy on that course, and um, I had told they they asked us what we wanted to go and fly, and I said I, I want to fly the Lightning. Actually, throughout my whole time in the Air Force, I had. I wanted to fly the Lightning. When I'd been in South Africa, I'd seen an advert uh, from the Royal Air Force said that join the Royal Air Force and the world is your oyster. And on the front page of this brochure was um, a squadron of Lightnings lined up and the pilots were walking back from a mission. And I looked at that and I just pointed at it and I said, that is me. And I was single-minded from that moment I want, I want to fly the Lightning. Well, I had 27 on my course at, uh, at Bali and uh, uh, six of us were posted to the Lightning. One was posted to Hunters, and the rest of the course all went uh, either to Canberra's or to the V-Force, Vulcans or Victors. So I got what I wanted. So I then went off down to uh, RAF Chevener in Devon uh, for a four-month course. It was a, a, a Lightning lead-in course, a pre-Lightning course, they called it. It was really a tactical weapons training. But I was out of, out, really out of, uh, the training world now, and Chibna was in fighter command. I was now entering the fighter world, because that's what I was learning down at Chibna on the Hunter. Uh, flying now had to become second nature and learning how to operate it, learning how to use the weapons, the guns, learning how to fly things like battle formation instead of close, close formation was just a daily thing you, you did. But now I had to learn battle formation. I had to learn how to do intercepts, basic intercepts, tactical low-level low, low level flying, in formation, in battle formations, air combat, the sport of kings. I had to learn all that there. I did that there and again, I, I would. They tried to persuade me throughout that course to switch to hunters because they wanted me to go to hunters. They did. They didn't because they were, they were all had come from hunter squadrons. But I said, no, I want to go fly the Lightning. I just want to fly the Lightning. The Lightning was the first supersonic high-performance aircraft that the uh, RAF had had, and uh, that's what I, as I've already said, I was focused on all the time. So, after my time at Chibna, and I was there from May to September 1967, right through what was a glorious summer, I had a fantastic time. And it's worth just saying here, in fact, that I go back to Battle of Britain, my father being a Battle of Britain pilot, and he had uh, always nurtured. They were my heroes uh, then, they're my heroes now, they've driven, me, they've driven my life. He installed a work hard, play hard ethic in me, which is how I always viewed the fighter pilot as. The work hard, play hard ethic was important. It, it has served me well. Sometimes I've worked hard and I played, other times I've played hard and I've worked. But for example, in the training, when I was doing training, I needed to work and I worked hard. And that's why I got the results that I did. I got the rewards that I wanted. So I left then and I arrived at RAF Coldershaw in uh, Norfolk, uh, which was the home of the Lightning in those days, the Operational Conversion Unit, to start my uh, training on the Lightning. I was delighted. And wherever I was, I, I, I loved um, Northumberland, I loved Anglesey, I loved Devon, and I loved Norfolk. And I loved the people I was working with all the time. It, I was quickly learning that actually I'd made the best decision in the world to join the Royal Air Force and I'd equally made the best decision to concentrate on uh, the Lightning. The first time I stood next to a Lightning I thought, wow, this is a big aircraft because it weighs 20 tonnes. It is a big aircraft. So I did the course there. The course there lasted six months and really I took to the Lightning like, like I'd taken to all the other aircraft, like a duck to water. Flying was definitely sort of in my, in my blood, and I just felt totally at home in the air. But the Lightning, performance-wise, was a quantum leap forward. We, every takeoff was a kick, a kick up the backside. We used to climb at 450 knots, converting to uh, Mach 0.9, i.e. Just, just below the, the speed of sound, and we could, we could go supersonic in the climb. The aircraft had the capability of flying at um, nearly 1,500 miles an hour, or put another way, at uh, twice the speed of sound at low level because the, the air, as you, go, as you go up, the air becomes uh, 
uh, less dense. So in the, in the, in the thick air down at uh, sea level, the, the speed looks, is very different. The indicated air speed is very different from what it looks like at a high level. And at, at sea level, we were restricted in the lightning to 650 knots. But believe me, when you're down close to the sea at 650 knots, you can feel it as well. And the acceleration was just amazing. One of the things we used to do in the lightning, in fact, uh, was what, what we call a, a reheat rotation takeoff. And uh, you could, uh, we could in, in the aircraft we had a cold short, we could take off without the reheat. If you use the reheat, it just gives you a bigger kick and uh, gets you in the air much, much quicker. In fact, so quick we launch ourselves down the runway. We'd uh, you'd get airborne and uh, you had to have your finger on the undercarriage button uh, to get the undercarriage up in time before you hit 250 knots. Because if you hadn't got the undercarriage up before 250 knots, then you would have the nose wheel stuck down and you'd have to come back and, and get it up again. And this, this, so we'd get airborne, sort of uh, get the undercarriage up, and at uh, 240 knots, uh, we'd rotate, uh, which would basically sort of stick right back into my stomach, and the aircraft would just stand on its backside and go straight up. That's just a little example. That wasn't, a, that wasn't an operational uh, takeoff, but I'm just trying to give you an indication of some of the, the, of the, of the lightning. The lightning was a dream to fly. It was single seater, although we did have two seaters for training. And to go solo, I did uh, four sorties, four dual sorties, lots of simulator work. I mean, like, like I've done throughout, there's always lots of uh, things to learn on the ground. So we did a ground school. We normally did a ground school first. Then we sort of introduced the simulator. We go into the simulator uh, to learn the emergencies and learn the checks and things like that. And progressively, we'd be introduced to the aircraft. So when you got into the aircraft, you actually sort of were, were quite well prepared for it. Um, but there was a huge amount to learn. And in six months there, again, as I said earlier on, the flying has to become second nature because really you've, you've got to learn you know, the conversion to the aircraft is very short. And then you start learning uh, about the operating side of it. And in the Lightning, for example, we had, uh, there was a radar. We had a radar. So I, as a single seat pilot, um, had to not only sort of work everything that was in the cockpit, but to operate it, I had to know how to operate the radar and use it. And I had a hand controller down here. And I can still feel it now. You can see my hand moving because that's what I was doing all the time. Because there were so many switches on it, you were just moving it. And, the, and that would change the picture in the B tube as we called it. I had to learn about that and carry out intercepts. And remember, everything's coming, happening very fast. And the, and the lightning, a lot of our work at that, that, that those days was done up at about 36,000 feet. And we would uh, carry out intercepts. We'd fly at uh, just, just below the speed of sound, 0.9. Other aircraft would come towards us. We'd start sort of with single aircraft and then it would slowly be in, uh, increased as we went through. But the radar uh, on the lightning, the ones we had, you were lucky if you picked up a, a target outside 20 to 25 miles. So you pick up the target. You're meant, you, you, this is where, on, on my side in particular, I've always had a bit of a mathematical mind and because you needed mental arithmetic. You had to do, you pick up a radar, a, a blip, and you had to work out what that um, aircraft, what height it was and what heading he was on. And the heading was really important because then you, you had to do, you, you knew what you were going to do once you worked out the heading um, because it was all to do with geometry and the, met, and the mental arithmetic was going on all the time. And that's basically, without, in, in simple terms, how we carried out our intercepts to get ourselves around into the rear hemisphere where we could shoot our missile at the target we, we were looking at. We also carried out head-on attacks as, as well, uh, but that's a, that, that comes the more advanced things we were doing. We went through a conversion phase, a base, what we called a basic radar phase, and then we went on to an advanced uh, radar phase, uh, which included not just radar, su supersonic attacks, attacks um, you know, where we'd accelerate to probably 1.6 Mach, something like that, intercepting a target that was uh, doing Mach 1.0 or whatever some of the Russian aircraft. Remember, we're training for the opposition. And in those days, Cold War, the opposition were the Russians. And the Russians had uh, high-speed bombers. They had slow-speed bombers. They had high-speed bombers as well. So we had to learn how to do uh, attacks against supersonic targets. We had to learn how to do attacks against uh, high-flying targets. And uh, the Lightning was ex extremely capable. The ceiling for the Lightning was actually, officially, 56,000 feet. But the engines were so powerful and, in, and the performance was so amazing. 
Uh, there's not a lightning pilot who hasn't been way above 56,000 feet. I've been up into the mid 60s, uh, but uh, there are stories. And lightning pilots have uh, lightnings have intercepted things like the U2s uh, at certain times, and they're up at 70, 80,000 feet. So there's lots of stories around. But the lightning was just a hugely, hugely capable aircraft. Twice the speed of sound could really. We used to what we call. We we would normally in going for a high-flying target, we would accelerate at the, uh, the tropopause, uh, which was around about 36,000 feet. You've got the troposphere, tropopause, and then the stratosphere, where the air gets very thin. And uh, we, would, uh, w we would boom at 36,000 feet. We'd go supersonic there. We used, we used to boom and zoom, uh, and then we convert our speed into height to, to go up to, to intercept the high-flying targets. When we were very high, I remember sort of when I was uh, up at about 64,000 feet. The world's very different up there. The, the horizon of the low, low levels looks level. Up there, it's round. The higher you go, it starts to get dark. And where you also notice it, the air is very thin. I talked about this, you're in, up in the stratosphere. And the air is very thin. And I mentioned the indicated airspeed in the thick air down below is 650 knots. Well, the indicated uh, airspeed up there would be very different from what it was down there. And the aircraft would really feel if it was on a knife edge. You had to really fly the aircraft quite carefully, or you could uh, and handle the engine pretty carefully as well. Or you could uh, quickly sort of uh, surge an engine or um, get uh, some sort of failure. Or um, you were pretty close at the high levels to the stall speed, even though the uh, indicated Mach number was close to the speed of sound. Difficult to explain, it would be a whole lesson to just talk about it anyway. So, those are the sort of things, and air combat training. Learning, again, reminding ourselves about uh, uh, how to fly battle formation at different speeds and different heights, then basic combat maneuvers, then into air to air combat, uh, intercepts, air combat, those sort of things we, we had to learn. But at the end of the course, and again, I, I'm pleased to report that I did very well, you're still only learning. I was now sort of uh, leaving my operational conversion unit exactly three years after I joined the Air Force. So I'd come a long way, and here I was, age 22, I think it was, and I was flying solo, a multi-million pound aircraft, the highest performance aircraft uh, that the Air Force had, and I used to think to myself, I used to take my face, I just don't, I don't believe and here I am, sort of uh, being trusted with one of these sort of uh, fantastic jets at age 22. What's more, I was now posted to my first operational squadron, uh, which was number 92 squadron. And I was going to um, a place called RAF Goodersloe in Germany. So I was going to a base that was the closest base to the uh, other side, uh, the Russians and the uh, East Germans at, at Goodersloe. And I was going as a new baby pilot. I was joining my first squadron. I, I still still hadn't finished my training because when I got to the base, uh, as well as having to, to go through an acceptance flying check and things like that, I then had to go um, into a, a combat-ready workup. And I forget how long it took, but uh, four or five months of combat-ready working up. There's so much more to learn. Um, learning about op the more the more complex operational uh, tasks of the aircraft. Things that I haven't covered at the OCU, but you learn on the individual squadrons you, you go to around the world, relating to the theatre that you're in and the, the uh, opposition you have. Uh, and there I, I had, uh, on the other side, we were closest, I said, closest uh, um, RAF base to the border, and not very far away, just on the other side, were a, a Russian squadrons, Russian East German squadrons of MiG-21s. They were the real, they were the, uh, um, the fighter threat, but there were plenty of others there sort of uh, waiting, as we thought, the uh, hordes of Russians waiting to uh, come across and start World War III. It was the, this was the Cold War we were in, and the Cold War was very, very real, particularly when you're that close to the border. At Goodestow itself, we had two squadrons of lightnings, we had two squadrons of uh, fighter reconnaissance hunters, we had a, a squadron, um, an RAF regiment squadron, 
we had a helicopter, an air support helicopter squadron. We had uh, some Bloodhound missiles, and we had lots more. And we had regular, regular exercises. And exercises, it's worth just saying, uh, because people don't fully understand it. You know, we, we, we go right through the sort of uh, the, the process of war. Sort of, uh, you go through a sort of period of uh, tension into you enter the war in a sort of conventional war phase and it builds up and it gets more and more tricky and dangerous and then we used to train for the nuclear phase as well. We used to have, for example, um, survivors in the, in the nuclear phase. I think we were training for the day when a nuclear attack might come. And when a nuclear attack might come, one of the things we would do is get every single aircraft, when we were expecting a, a nuclear strike, we get every single aircraft on the base into the air and away from the base uh, to hold um, until the strike had happened. And then we, would, uh, then we would hopefully come back to that base if we could. If we couldn't, we'd, we'd have to go somewhere else, wherever. And um, we used to train for operations in uh, nuclear, biological and chemical conditions. Again, all this is the subject of uh, a lot of learning a lot of individual talks about I'm only just scraping the surface of it, mentioning it. For example, you know, we, we would do um, operational turnarounds, which would take eight minutes rearming the aircraft with missiles and guns and things. It was a very real environment. It was a work hard environment. It was an uh, understand, you've got to understand what you're doing there. Air, uh, reconnaissance, reconnaissance training. Was, uh, was important to us. We had to be able to identify all of the aircraft that we were likely to see. Not just aircraft, we had to be able to identify ships as well. So there, there was a, a lot to see. So I went there and I became operational after I think it was four months. You, first of all, you become limited combat ready and then you become combat ready. And then when I was combat ready, it meant you could take part in all the, air, all the uh, exercises. It meant you were combat ready, you were ready to go to war. That's what it means. And we used to, there we, we had on, um, we had a thing called battle flight, where we had two lightnings on five minutes readiness, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And uh, we were regularly scrambled, five minutes, day and night. I've been scrambled day and night, and we never missed the five minute uh, target. Middle of night, we'd be airborne in, in four minutes from the crew. We, 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 were, we did sleep, you didn't sleep. We, we, we used to go to bed in, in, in our flying kit, basically. But you never really sort of slept, you sort of dozed. Because uh, when the scramble, the horn comes, uh, you rush to the cockpit, you're in it. The ground crew are trained to do what they did. Everything's set up, and, and, you're, and really as you're strapping up, in, you're almost starting the engines, and then you're taxiing out. And four minutes later, from being in bed, four minutes later, you're in the air. So what do we do on that? We used to get scrambled regularly. Occasionally there were practice scrambles. Occasionally scrambled to go and launch a missile to fly all the way across to uh, Cardigan Bay off the coast of Wales to fire a missile in, uh, in, in a range that was there just to make sure we're all set up, we're ready to, ready to do the job. But most of the time we would be scrambled because uh, the other side, the big 21s, were testing our reaction they, they'd launch from their bases, they'd point themselves at the border, we'd be scrambled, uh, and they'd actually sort of, there's a little kink, they could just clip the border, and by the time we were scrambled and got up there, they were back on the other side. So we end, we'd end up with the lightnings going up one side of the border, up and down, and the MiG-21s on the other side of the border. We could see each other, and we used to test their reaction, I, I will say that as well. But most of the scrambles we had, funnily enough, were for light aircraft, light aircraft that were flying towards the border that were lost or just, they were just in the wrong position because where the border was um, there was actually a zone there which was uh, no aircraft went into and there was another area known known as uh, the buffer zone but where you didn't go into either so so you, you, you were basically protected supposedly you were protected from straight across the border we used to get these light aircraft would fly into the into the, the buffer zone um, and we always used to fly around with our radios set to emergency all the time. So we, all the time we were listening out on the emergency frequency as well as whatever frequency we were on. And if we ever heard, and the reason was, because if, if uh, the radar stations ever saw an aircraft in the, um, where he shouldn't be, they call out brass monkey, brass monkey, brass monkey. 
and that was a sign to everybody to turn onto a westerly heading and check their position, uh, which we did uh, a lot. These were the people we were intercepting, a lot light aircraft, uh, that most of them were flying probably at 100, 120 knots. We were flying uh, at uh, the slowest the light could go, was about 180 knots. So you couldn't actually sort of get into a formation with them, but we used to come past. When, when these light aircraft would, would see us coming past, and remember, we did this by day and night too, uh, coming, coming past on, the right, uh, on their right hand side, they'd see a stonking great uh, fully armed uh, lightning. They'd get the message. We, most of the time, would get the number and they'd get their punishment when they got back. So that happened a lot. And in fact, sometimes we, I remember when 1968 it was, um, when the Russians invaded uh, Czechoslovakia. And there we used to train, there were three corridors that uh, used to go down to Berlin, to which from, from uh, uh, the west. And they, you could only get to Berlin by going down one of these corridors. And we used to train for the uh, eventuality that uh, the corridors were closed by the Russians and what we would do. And basically, a probe transport aircraft would be sent down and um, we would go down as fighter escorts uh, to protect them and react against anything that came up to, to intercept us or what have you, fighters. We used to train for that um, with the Americans and also the French. The Germans were not allowed near the, uh, the border at all. That's why we used to trade with the Americans and the French in those days. So this did happen. When the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia, they closed the, the corridors. We increased the number of aircraft on uh, QRA battle flight. It went straight up from two aircraft. We had about, within no time at all, we had, I think, uh, eight or 10 aircraft uh, ready. And we were in a very high state of readiness, ready to go uh, and do whatever, but in particular in this case, to go with the probes down the corridor and react to whatever happened. Well, on this occasion, fortunately, the uh, politicians won the day. I mean, you, it, 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 it's like anything. The military get involved when the, when the politicians fail. That's what normally happens. But I'm pleased to report the politicians didn't fail on this day. The corridors were reopened and it, never, it, it didn't happen. But that gives you that as an example. One little other example you might be interested in, when we I talked about survival scramble, when we trade for the nuclear attack. But another thing, we used to have uh, eye patches. We would, we would train, we would fly with, plan to fly with an eye patch over one eye to protect your eyes against the nuclear explosion. So that if the nuclear explosion came and you'd uh, lost the sight in, in, in your good eye, the fact you'd had a patch on the other eye meant you, you'd still have one good eye. It's another useful little story. So that gives you the flavour. We used to, and we used to train for uh, the aircraft coming across low level. We used to fly what we call low level search patterns. So we do a lot of low level intercept work in, in Germany as well. Man, low level search patterns down at uh, a thousand feet. We would intercept the aircraft down to 250 feet or lower at whatever speed. Our radars in the Lightning were not that effective uh, down at uh, the low level. You'd see, you'd see other aircraft only at a very short range, quite frankly. So your Mark I eyeball came in quite useful uh, as well. But it was all, it was very real. It was the Cold War. It, it was just one of the, I'll, I'll never forget it. But that's Germany. So then what happened? I then came back, actually I then did a tour um, as an instructor back on the Lightning at the Lightning Operational Conversion Unit. We also had an operational uh, task there, and that was uh, associated with NATO. Well, we were NATO in Germany as well, but with different, different tasks. And if you think about it, where I've talked about where we were in the Cold War in Germany and what the threat was and how we dealt with it right close to the border. Back in the UK, it's rather different because really, you, in Germany, we were dealing with the first, we were the first line, the first line of uh, the threat that was coming back to us. By the time anything got to the UK, they were through the second and third, third lines, quite frankly. But the threat back in the UK, as well as coming from um, Eastern Europe, we had a, um, an air, air, air defence identification zone um, that covered the UK, United Kingdom air defence region. It was a huge area that uh, covered about twice the size uh, of the UK itself over the sea, and what have you. And that's what we policed. We were responsible for the air defence of the UK back in the UK. 
And a lot of the flying, a lot of the targets we'd see in the, in the Cold War days, that actually they're still seen today, were Russian bombers that would come around, they would launch out of a place called Murmansk, up in, uh, or close to it, up, up in, right up in the north. Um, if you look at Norway, if you think of Norway, right up north. They come around, they come around the, the North Cape, and they, they come down the North Sea uh, and uh, to do what, what I'm going to tell you in just a moment. We used to work in the UK. We would work very closely with the uh, uh, Americans out of Iceland, with the Norwegians, their F-16s, things like that. We had uh, air, airborne early warning aircraft working with us, feeding us information. What these bombers were doing, Russian bears and badgers and blinders and other aircraft as well, there were a number of things they might be doing. They might be transiting to uh, Cuba. They might be uh, playing, very often the Russian fleet would be in the Atlantic, North Atlantic, and the, 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 the bombers would uh, they, they'd come down and operate with, the, uh, with their fleet. They might be practicing, and this is something they did a lot, their, their wartime role against the UK. And we knew that the Russian bombers' role was to sort of fly down and get into um, a, a, a range from uh, the UK where they could uh, launch their standoff uh, weapons. We knew that that range was at least 300 miles away from the UK. So we were in a situation now where we had to be uh, able to intercept um, these bombers well away from the UK. And that's why a lot of our sorties were flown when we were operational. And this is from, I talked about battle, battle flight in uh, Germany. In the UK, it's known as QRA, Quick Reaction Alert. And in the UK, because we tended to get more notice about uh, the intelligence would actually sometimes give us day's notice of, of, of Russian aircraft coming down into the area. Very occasionally, they sneak in low level and, and, and you didn't get any notice, so you, you, you did get the odd surprise. But it was important for us to get airborne. We were on 10 minute readiness in the UK versus five minutes in, uh, in Germany. Very important that we got ourselves up and we used to get up, we used to operate in a place called the Iceland Faroes Gap. Most of the time we were five to 700 miles um, north of the UK. Uh, very un inhospitable up there. But I've, uh, uh, but it's very realistic as well. I did that in the, in the Lightning. I did it in the Phantom operate when I was operating from uh, Lucas. And it's worth saying, when I moved on to the Phantom, it's, it's, uh, it's another high performance aircraft, it can go at twice the speed of sound like uh, the Lightning. I personally didn't, it, it was a nice aircraft to fly, but I preferred the Lightning. The Phantom had two, two people in it, a pilot and a navigator, but it was a, the Phantom was a real war machine. It had, the, it, the, its operational capability compared with the Lightning was vast. Because instead of having two missiles like the Lightning had, it had eight missiles four heat-seeking missiles and four uh, radar-guided missiles. It could carry a gun as well. Uh, it could carry more fuel. That was always a problem with the Lightning. So we used to, like, we used to re rely, throughout our, our operational time, a lot on air-to-air -air refueling as well, particularly back in the UK. But importantly, the Phantom had an, a different navigation system. It had inertial navigation, and it had uh, a, a, a very capable radar a multi-mode radar that could uh, be used in, in all sorts of different sort of uh, ways, um, either for intercept work or to look at the coast or, uh, like I said, it was just multi-capable. Multi the main difference, though, was when you saw a target, you could pick it up at a far greater range than we ever could in the Lightning. Um, and so you didn't, you need, whereas you still needed to have good mental arithmetic and reaction, you had more time to do it uh, in the Phantom, more time to see the targets, to calculate where they were coming from. Not only that, but the radar was so capable, it was much better at picking up, uh, with its pulse Doppler radar, picking up um, aircraft at uh, low level in particular. So that made it a big difference. So we could get ourselves in the position. Wor you know, working, working as a team, as I said, air-to-air -air refueling, airborne early warning, other aircraft from uh, the Americans or the Norwegians or, or wherever. It was a team effort all the time. And we would be there. We would always be there in time to intercept the uh, Russian aircraft. Another thing that the Russians might do, which they have been, they used very occasionally in those days, they'd come down into the North Sea. 
to have a look at the oil fields. And in more recent times, because we've uh, you read about the typhoons still doing that, they, these missions today, and in recent years the Russians have certainly been getting quite adventurous in, in coming down into the UK airspace, and they've even been seen in the English Channel. And when if I, that, that, that I find very interesting because um, international waters and airspace starts when you are 12 miles from the coast. Anything, and they're quite, the Russians in, in most of the airspace where we intercepted them are quite entitled to be there because they're outside the 12 mile limit. You think of a pair of Russians going through the English Channel and think how close England is to France. Uh, and you think of the territorial waters, the English 12 miles, say the French 12 miles, makes you think. So, but again, this was old Cold War and it was very, very, it was very real, very real. Most important, we never knew sort of uh, when the, when, when things going to go happen, so it was very important that we, our training was kept at a very high level. So we exercised all the time. Uh, we had uh, stations were tested all the time, annually with what we call tactical evaluations, tacky valves. Um, you were operationally at a very high readiness level, ready to do, but it was totally different from what life is like now since the end of the Cold War. So I've covered so far, I've talked a bit about the lightning and a bit more about the, uh, the Phantom. That wasn't the end of my Cold War aircraft because then I, I went on to the Tornado. And in fact, I had the, the honor of actually um, being the very first RAF pilot to fly the uh, fighter version of the Tornado. I had the job of commanding the first unit of, of bringing the Tornado into RAF service, building up the first unit, commanding the first unit, getting it operational, and we were taking over from the Phantom uh, now. So, and the Tornado, again, this was all Cold War, doing the same job, it was designed for the Cold War um, as an interceptor, and it was a very capable interceptor it was too. Well, I will say a couple of things about the Tornado. Again, it's the same as the Lightning in the Phantom. It could do uh, twice the speed of sound and did uh, very capably and easily. A difference uh, in the uh, Tornado was the fact that uh, the, the speed limit the lightning was 650 knots at low level, and that was mainly because of the shape of the radome in the uh, air intake. Because if you if you got much far, any faster than that, you you ran a problem of surging an engine at low level. The Phantom's limit was 750 knots. The Tornado's limit was 800, so it was the fastest of the lot at, at low level. And um, I I know that uh, the Tornado has been well above 800 at, at low level. The Tornado. Is, is, is a hot ship uh, at low level. It's got wings. The wings can be in various positions from having them 25 degrees swept to 67 degrees swept with intermediate positions in between. So it's a, it, it's a complete new capability. The, the Tornado had uh, inertial navigation uh, systems like the Phantom, but we had problems with the radar when it first came in, but uh, the radar was designed to be a quantum leap forward because we could track 10 targets. Think back to the, the and we could pack, track 10 targets and technically when it happened, we, we could pick up uh, aircraft at vast ranges as well. The other thing that the Tornado had, which others didn't have, it had the capability for data link. So you could link on data link with ground, airborne early warning, other aircraft. You could manage a form, a, a, another aircraft in a formation that was hundreds of miles away. The Tornado had great capability. The missiles it had eventually ASRAM and AMRAM, again, quantum leap forward in missile capability. So the Tornado did get a lot of criticism in its early day, in my view, was a really, really good aircraft when they took it out of service too early in my view. And I, as a Lightning, Phantom and Tornado pilot, I've been asked and others have been asked, if you had to go to war, which aircraft would you prefer to go to war in? And to be quite frank, with the capability it has at the end, the Tornado is the answer. That is the answer. The one area that the Tornado and the Phantom were deficient on was in the engine performance. All three aircraft, and particularly the Phantom and the Tornado, which were very much designed for low-level operations, were fantastic at low-level operations. But whereas the Lightning sort of had the engines that uh, could operate at any level, particularly the medium and high levels, the Tornado and the engine and the uh, Phantom, uh, both uh, went subsonic, 
would run out of puff in the medium levels. When they got supersonic again, when we got to high level, and you got supersonic, they really sort of started to, to perform again. But um, it, the engines performed very differently from the, the Lightning. The Lightning, for all level operations, had by far the nicest engines to work with. But they were all, I loved them all, quite frankly. If you ask me which aircraft was my favourite, I would still tell you the Lightning is my favourite because that was my first aircraft, that's what I wanted to fly, and I absolutely loved flying that aircraft. It was single seat, it was me, it was me. The Phantom and Tornado had a crew of two, and don't get me wrong, I enjoyed flying with a crew of two as well. And the crew of two, um, when it's working together, is a very, very capable unit. Some of my backseaters, the navigators, we didn't call them, they weren't really navigators, they were what we call fighter gators. They were weapon system operators. But they were fighter gators in my view. We worked as a team, and uh, some of my best friends um, are fighter gators. That I think I sort of covered really, it's taking me um, without I'm going to, without talking in more detail about it in certain areas. That's taken me through my sort of uh, Cold War experience. I will raise one other thing though, and when and that's when when I left the Lightning before I went to fly the Phantom, I went for three years. To, fly, to instruct on the NAT, which I trained on years before at uh, RAF Valley. And in Cold War operations, do you know what we used to do? We used to go, we used to take a, every uh, three months or so, we'd take uh, five or six NATs up to RAF Kinloss in uh, Scotland, um, and uh, where there was probably an exercise work going on with the Navy. And we would operate uh, with the Vulcans. Uh, the Vulcans would uh, be simulating, uh, they were Russian bombers coming in, and we would be with the Vulcans, sitting under their wing, and uh, because we were the standoff missiles, we were small, agile, and, uh, and at a certain point, at the right range, that you'd expect a Russian to launch his standoff weapon at the UK, or whatever, we would be launched by the, uh, the Vulcan, and then the other forces would be would have to intercept us. They'd have to they'd have to shoot down uh, this uh, this standoff missile that had been launched. And so that's even when I was uh, instructing, I was still involved in Cold War operations. I think I probably covered a lot, but there's a lot I've left out as well. It's such a vast subject. All I'll just finish by saying is the Cold War was very real but it was uh, very interesting, and the aircraft I flew in the Cold War will be part of me. I loved it, loved it all uh, for the rest of my life. Thank you.